Hi, my name's Lucy. I'm a junior and I'm a part of Chapel Street Students. I was kind of raised in the church. My family, we'd always identified as Christians, always believed in God, and I kind of just, for a long time, just like said I did, I never really knew what it meant or what Jesus dying on the cross actually meant or if it did anything for me. Life at that time was fine until about fourth grade. My dad had passed away and that event of my dad passing was kind of the big, I guess you could say, road bump in my faith. Seventh and eighth grade of middle school, I was just living as like a normal middle schooler. I was going through a lot of insecurity issues. I was so sad and like just at such a horrible point in my life. With depression and anxiety, there would be days I just like couldn't look at myself in the mirror. Feeling of like looking at myself and like that person in the mirror is different than like the person that I actually am. You look at yourself and you hate yourself. Depression, I kind of think of it as like you're stuck in this box and you like yourself, you're trying everything to push yourself out of it. But no matter what you do, even if you put yourself, push yourself outside of that layer, there's another box right outside of it. Like it's a constant everyday ongoing battle. When quarantine had hit, that's when my depression, I felt like was taking over every single part of my body. I couldn't control anything I was doing. It was just tears and anger every second of every day. I was at the point where like, I just wanted it all to stop. I remember I was laying in bed, it was probably two, three in the morning, and I was just laying there with my thoughts, bawling my eyes out crying. Those bad thoughts were like hitting extra hard that night. And the thought of actually doing something to harm myself had never really been super big until that night. I had tried everything. I had gone to therapy, nothing was working. So I prayed to God and I was just like, I don't even know if you're real or what's going on, but like this is like my last chance. Like this is my last shot. And if this doesn't work, then I just don't think that like I'm meant to be here anymore. I just remember like just laying there after I had done praying and I just felt this random like wave of like calmness come over me. With dealing with depression and anxiety, I always have like this heavy pit in my stomach that like something bad's gonna happen. And I remember for the first time in months, like that feeling that was in my stomach and my chest, it had just like been like lifted off of me. Ever since coming to Chapel Street, my entire life has changed. Obviously God has changed my life, but I prayed for so long to have that community of people. I can come to these people with any issue and I'm not gonna feel judged by it and I'm not gonna feel like my feelings are invalidated. And being here for the two hours every night on Sunday night for D group, it's like my escape in a way. It's kind of like, yeah, I have school tomorrow, but like it's Sunday, I get to go see the people that God has blessed me with. And then I decided this summer to take the next step into getting baptized during the stadium service. Just standing there like after I'd been baptized and standing there with some of my best friends, this wave of emotion coming after me because I was like, if you didn't have God, Lucy, like you wouldn't be standing here right now. Like you wouldn't be here right now. God has done a lot in my life the past almost two years since I have God in my life and I have opened up his word and I've read who he has made me to be, that I was knit together in my mother's womb, that he created me for a purpose. All of that trumps every other bad thought that I have. When you give your life to God, life is not gonna be all daisies and rainbows and nowhere in the Bible does God promise that. But what he does promise is when you go through those valleys and there's low parts and those parts where you feel like, I don't wanna be here anymore, he's the one that's there. There is just no doubt in my mind that God isn't real. If he can pick me up from the point I was at where we're literally about to end my life, I know that he can do that same exact thing for absolutely anybody.
Well, let's just take a moment and pray, okay? Lord, we thank you that we can be here today as, as a family, as your family, to worship. And how we thank you for Lucy and her story, the courage to tell her story. Uh, we thank you for the video team and our Chapel Street Student Ministries that has helped her tell that story. And I just ask that you would remind us today and anyone who particularly needs to see that story today. That you are the God who knows where we are. And you're the God who tells us who we are in your eyes. And that uh, we would trust both who you are and who you say that we are. Thank you for sharing that with us today. And teach us now through your word in ways that we can understand. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Well, as a culture, uh, we love to ask what some people call mega questions. Now, a mega question is just a question to ask who or what is the greatest, who or what is the most important thing. And we ask these kinds of questions all the time, don't we? Like, who is the greatest quarterback? Who's the GOAT, right? Is it Tom Brady? Is it Peyton Manning? Is it Aaron Rodgers? Sorry, that's the only picture I could find of uh, Aaron Rodgers. Or <laughs> we think maybe... What's the greatest movie of all time? You know, is it Shawshank Redemption? Or is it maybe The Godfather? Or going way back, Citizen Kane? Or the runaway favorite, The Princess Bride? Right? <laughs> That's my vote. Or maybe what's the greatest breakfast cereal? Just holler it out. What's your favorite breakfast cereal of all time? Frosted Mini Wheats, Cheerios. Lucky Charms. Lucky Charms. Okay, I found somebody made uh, an image of the uh, Mount Rushmore of great breakfast cereals, and here's what they had. They had Cap'n Crunch, Frosted Flakes, Fruity Pebbles, and Lucky Charms. And my boys would say, what about Cinnamon Toast Crunch? It's like the greatest. I would say, what about Alphabets? Who, who's with me remember Alphabets? I mean, you get sugar and education at the same time. You know, they don't make them anymore. They don't make alphabets anymore. So we have a whole generation of children who can't spell. <laughs> now the passage we look at today, out of Mark's gospel, also involves a mega question, a question about the greatest, the most important. Now we're still in our series from the gospel of Mark called Following the King. And we are now, if you've been following along, reading your Mark journal, uh, you know that we're now in the last week of Jesus' earthly life and ministry. He's already entered Jerusalem in what we call the triumphal entry, riding on a donkey, indicating that he's fulfilling the prophecy of the king, the Messiah, who would come into Jerusalem. He has cleansed the temple of the money changers, thus creating this serious conflict with religious leaders. He's been questioned by a group of Pharisees and Herodians who are trying to trap him into saying something for which they can have him destroyed. So things are coming to a head. Last week we saw the trap question they presented was, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar? To which Jesus gave an answer that is both profound in its time and so relevant today when he said, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Now we pick up the story uh, later that same day. We're still in the same day. Uh, and we're in Mark chapter 12. Let me read this story for you, beginning in verse 28. And one of the scribes came up, and we'll talk about this scribe in just a minute. And one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another. And seeing that he answered them well, Jesus answered his questioners well, asked him, which commandment is the most important of all? Jesus answered, the most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than, the whole, than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. 
And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared to ask him any more questions. Uh, most of us are familiar with at least part of this, uh, this story from Mark's gospel. It appears in several different versions in the different gospel accounts. But I'm gonna begin unpacking it today with a curious question. This is a curious question. Years ago, uh, when our boys were quite young, one of them, who was only about five years old at the time, uh, piped up at the family dinner table, just kind of out of nowhere, and said, Daddy, are you the boss of our family? <laughs> Took me by surprise. Curious question. I had no idea he even knew what a boss was. He's like five. But maybe he heard someone at school say, you're not the boss of me, or something like that. And I also kind of knew that it was a tricky question. Because it wasn't a simple yes or no question. Uh, because if I said yes, I'd be sort of disregarding my wife's role in partnership in our marriage. If I said no, I'd sort of be abdicating my role as husband and father. And I could feel five pairs of eyes staring at me, four boys and my wife. Um, so I, I just thought I should probably choose my words carefully. So I said something like, well, I don't know that I would use the word boss. But I do believe God wants me to do my best to be a good leader uh, for our family and to protect and provide for you boys and for mom. Something like that. Well, he didn't look like he was terribly satisfied with that answer. And he thought for a moment and said, well, if you are the boss of our family, why do you always have to ask mom? He said. <laughs> Another curious question. Mark tells us, one of the scribes came up and heard them disputing with one another and seeing that he answered them well, asked him which commandment is the most important of all. Now, before we get to the question, I wanna talk just for a moment about the questioner. Mark says this man is a scribe. Now, in that culture, a scribe was sort of half theologian, half lawyer. Uh, he was an expert in the Torah. Uh, the Old Testament law. And the scribe walks in on that contentious conversation where Jesus is confronted by uh, religious leaders who are his enemies and the Herodians, and they're trying to trap him. They're clearly trying to trap him to get him to say something that they can report to Rome or that will discredit him in front of his people. And he observes rightly that Jesus confounds them with his wisdom and with his intellect and with his wit. And that's what Mark means when he says, seeing that he answered them well. And then he asks a curious question. Which commandment is the most important of all? Now, a couple of things here. Uh, why does he ask this particular question? What, what's his motivation? And I think there are two possibilities. Maybe he's still trying to test Jesus. Maybe he thinks he has a better question than the one about taxes and Caesar. What's the, what's the most important commandment? Or maybe he's heard Jesus respond to the trap question, to the trick question, and he's impressed. And so he gets Jesus aside and asks him a sincere question. And from the way the conversation goes, I would guess the latter, that this comes from a rather sincere place in this scribe. The question is, which commandment is the most important of all? It's a mega question. Now, to us, it seems like a no-brainer because we, you know, have the New Testament and we read about the question. But at the time, it was a source of a kind of endless debate among religious scholars. Rabbis and teachers of the law had determined that the Torah, which are the first five books of our Old Testament, contained 613 laws or commandments called the mitzvah, uh, the Hebrew word for commandments, and of those, 365 laws are negative. Do not do this. For example, do not take God's name in vain. We're familiar with that one from the Ten Commandments. There are others. Do not eat non-kosher flying insects. That's one of them. It doesn't seem like that would need to be a law, does it really? But there's a third one. Do not eat raisins. I totally agree. Raisins are evil. And then there were 248 positive laws, things we, that, that God's people were to do. Respect your father and mother, also from the Ten Commandments. Leave the corners of a field uncut for the poor. Say the Shema 
twice every day. We'll talk about what the Shema was in just a moment. And the list expanded then from 613 to more than 1,500 laws and commandments in what was called the Mishnah, which was the oral tradition from rabbinical teaching. Rabbis would debate all the time, which were the heavy commandments and which were the light commandments in degree of importance. So it was common for them to debate this question, which is the greatest, the most important of all the commandments? What really matters to God? What does he expect or want most of me? So it's a curious question and it's a good question. I think this man, just is just me, I think this man is uh, intrigued by Jesus. I think he sees something in Jesus that's attractive, that's challenging, uh, that's uh, winsome, and something that's true, that resonates with him. And I think we would, he is what we would, might call today a spiritual seeker after truth. I think it's quite likely there are people right here in this room today or watching online who are a bit like this scribe meaning you're interested in Jesus, you might be intrigued by Jesus, you're impressed by Jesus, but you, have, you still have some questions for him, some questions in your mind and heart. And to this question we see in the story, Jesus gives a revolutionary answer. Revolutionary answer. Just about uh, two years or so ago, uh, kind of right before COVID really hit, uh, we had brand new neighbors move into the house right behind our house in our neighborhood, so next door neighbors behind us. So we wanted to meet them as quickly as we could. And so my wife, I think, made some cookies and took them over to the house and met, uh, met the wife and learned that they were Palestinian in background. A couple of days later, I was out in the backyard, I don't know, raking some leaves or something, and I noticed that the husband came out to kind of do the same thing. So I walked over and introduced myself and welcomed him to the neighborhood. And I was asking him, you know, where have you guys moved from? Um, and uh, what do you do? And then he returned that uh, line of conversation. He asked me, so what, what do you do? And I said, well, I'm a pastor at a local church. He said, ha, hi, I'm your new Muslim neighbor, he said. <laughs> Big smile on his face. And since that time, they've been in our home, we've been in their home for dinner, we're getting, getting to know them. But um, that husband and I have since developed a kind of neighboring competition. And the competition happens mostly when it snows. Now some of you know uh, that I, I like shoveling snow. Uh, I don't know why, I just like it. I know it's a little bit weird, but I enjoy the challenge and the exercise and the feeling when I'm done. I posted this picture a couple weeks ago uh, on my Facebook page, and I got 170 likes. <laughs> my social media inter, uh, empire just exploding. <laughs> that picture right there. Uh, but, but I have a system. I, uh, when it snows, I get up really early. I like to get up early anyway, like 5 a.m. It's dark, and I start shoveling, and I use my big, wide uh, push shovel first to clear the driveway, then I take my smaller shovel, and I do the sidewalks. Now, the sidewalk goes in front of our house, our yard, then it goes along the side, and it keeps going all the way from our yard to our neighbor's yard all the way to the corner. So usually I would take my shovel and do our, our sidewalk and go down the side all the way to the end of my property and would stop there because you know that's their property. That's his responsibility to do his walk. Mine's done, right? So I did that uh, shortly after the, the, when I met uh, this, this guy. I, so I, it snowed and I, I did my whole system, did the sidewalk, stopped at his property. And then later in the day, came back home for some reason, noticed, I just, I just noticed and looked, and I noticed that the whole sidewalk was on all the way to the corner, but even mine had been done again. It was, because my shovel only, only clears about that much, but it was completely, the sidewalk completely clear, and it had been done with a snowblower. Because you can tell the, the clean edges, right? I thought, oh, he did his and mine, even though I already did mine, and he did it better. Now it's on, right? <laughs> Because now I do mine and I do his just to see what he's going to do next. And we've never talked about it, but it's a secret little neighboring competition. No way he's going to out-neighbor me, even with a snowblower. <laughs> Jesus says, verse 29. The most important is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. 
So Jesus starts with what I would call an expected answer. Uh, he responds with the expected and very orthodox answer. He quotes uh, th from the Old Testament book of Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy chapter six. We read, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. This is called the Shema. It's the prayer every Jewish person was commanded and expected to pray twice a day. Not unlike we might pray the Lord's Prayer every day or some other prayer that we've memorized uh, across the years. Now, a couple things here. Uh, the Shema says, hear, O Israel. This is like saying, listen up. What comes next matters. Hear what? The Lord our God, the Lord is one. Now, we can easily miss how significant this line is. But it's absolutely unique in the entire ancient world. There are two different words used for Lord and for God. The Lord, that's the Hebrew name for God. That's his personal name, Yahweh, is our God. The word for that is Elohim. That's the generic word for God. So the Lord, Yahweh, our God, is one. The cultures surrounding ancient Israel were all polytheistic. That is, they made images of wood and stone and gold to represent all of their gods and goddesses. There was Baal of the Canaanites, who was a fertility god. There was Ashtoreth, uh, the female counterpart of Baal. There was Chemosh of the Moabites, who was the destroyer, the god of war, and dozens of others in the ancient cultures, each represented by images or idols like this one. But the Israelites were commanded by God not to make images of Yahweh. Why? Because their God was greater than any image of stone or gold. Their God was mysterious, holy, and invisible. Yahweh was one. There was no other God, small g, like Yahweh. Then this ancient commandment is very clear about what Yahweh wants most, what God expects from his people. And it's not fear as in terror of the capricious and malevolent gods of the pagan cultures, not groveling submission, but what he wants is different from all the other pagan gods. What he wants from his people is love. Love. Now, we just had a week where we celebrated love, right? Valentine's Day was... Monday, hope you didn't miss it. It's the day we set aside to, to express love, usually romantic love, but sometimes just friendship love as well. Uh, and by the way, if you wanna have fun on Valentine's Day, next Valentine's Day, go to uh, like a jewel store in the middle of the day. Just walk in and, and observe. It, it, you'll see this, they're crawling, it's just crawling with men <laughs> who are, searching through the cards and walking around holding little things of flowers and candy, trying not to make eye contact with each other because they all kind of forgot. And I won't tell you exactly how I know that to be true, but I, I do. <laughs> but what kind of love does God want? What kind of love? Jesus says, love the Lord your God with all your heart. Now, we tend to think of the heart as the seat of our emotional lives, which is true in many ways. But in the ancient world, the heart was more than that. It was more than emotions. It was the center of one's being, what we, what we might call the self. Our emotions and our will, sort of the well of our inner being out of which all issues of life flow. Jesus continues, love the Lord your God with all your soul. Now the Greek word for soul was suke, from which we get our word psyche or psychology, and it refers to something even deeper than the heart. If we go back to the book of Genesis, God, uh, breathed into Adam's nostrils the breath of life, Genesis says, and he became a living soul. The Hebrew word is nefesh. The soul is the uniquely spiritual dimension of every human being. The part of us that allows us to relate to the God who created us. Love the Lord your God with all your strength, meaning we are to love God uh, with and through what we do in and with our bodies. What we do, how we live, is to be an expression of our love for God. And then Jesus says, with all your mind. Now, if you were paying attention carefully, Jesus actually adds this word to the Shema. Mind is not in there in Deuteronomy. Jesus adds it, and this scribe surely would have noticed this. 
because he was an expert in Torah. Jesus is saying we have to love God with our intellect, with our logic, with our reason, to love the truth about who God is. Now, this is significant. I want us to hear this today. Significant, especially in our modern culture, because our culture has generally accepted that truth is whatever we feel it to be, right? We think now with our hearts. In their book, The Coddling of the American Mind, the authors call this the untruth of emotional reasoning. And what they mean is, when we determine truth by what we feel, God then can become whoever we want him to be. Like the guy who came into my office years ago. He's had an affair with the secretary at work. She was expecting a child from that affair. He defended himself and justified himself to me by saying, hey, God wants me to be happy, right? She makes me happy. I'm like, ooh, no. No. Jesus is saying we are to love God with all that we are, emotions, our will, our actions, and yes, our minds. That means learning who God is in truth. But Jesus is not finished here. That was sort of the expected answer for the scribe. But he goes on to give an unexpected answer, verse 31. The second, the guy only asked him for one. What's the most important? Jesus gives a second. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Now here he jumps to another Old Testament passage, Leviticus chapter 19, where we read, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against the sons of your own people, but you shall love your neighbor as yourself. I am the Lord. Now you might remember that in Luke's gospel, chapter 10, another expert in the law, kind of like a scribe, asks a similar mega question to Jesus. He says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus answers, what's written in the law? How do you read it? And the man then gives the correct answer, repeating the Shema. He says, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Jesus says, you've answered correctly. Do this and live. But Luke continues and says, and seeking to justify himself, this man says, and who is my neighbor? And Jesus answers by telling a story. We know it as the story of the Good Samaritan, likely the most famous story Jesus ever told. I can summarize it. He says, a man is beaten, robbed, and left for dead on the side of a road. A priest comes walking by, super religious guy, walks right by the man. A Levite comes walking by, super religious guy, walks right by the guy. But a Samaritan comes by. And a Samaritan stops, cares for the man. Binds up his wounds, puts him on his animal, takes him to an inn, slaps down his visa card, says, take care of anything he needs. Now we know the zinger in the story, right? Because the Jews despised the Samaritans. If Jesus told this story today, he might say, um, the, the hero of the story is a Taliban soldier. Something that would shock us. Now why would Jesus do, why would he make the Samaritan the hero of the story? Three reasons, I think. First, because a man was seeking to justify himself. He knew good and well there were people he despised. He knew good and well there were people he was not willing to love. So he's asking Jesus, where are the boundaries, Jesus? How far do you expect my love of neighbor to go? How much of the sidewalk should I shovel? And you can even see this at the end of that story if you read it when Jesus asked him which man was a neighbor to the one who was robbed and the guy says the one who had mercy on him. He can't even bring himself to say the Samaritan out loud. He wants to justify himself and he can't. He can't. Second, Jesus does this to make a point that loving one's neighbor does not mean just loving those who are like you. See, the ancient Israelites assumed that the loved one's neighbor meant to love other Israelites, right? Makes sense. To love their people, people like them. And I think we do the exact same thing today. One of the fundamental sins of human beings is that we're tribal. We form ourselves in the tribes, us and them, us and them, us and them. It's human nature, fallen human nature, 
but human nature. To like, to feel most comfortable with, to hang out with, to love those who are most like us. And Jesus is shattering that assumption. Who is my neighbor? It's my physical neighbor. It's people who live in my, on my street, on my block, in my apartment building, in my dorm room. Yeah, people like me. But they're also my human neighbors, including those unlike me, even my enemies. You know, we all have someone. We all have some group that we find difficult to love, that we don't want to love. And that's why this is revolutionary. Have you ever noticed that the entire New Testament that we have, that we read week by week, was written in the context of the Roman Empire. That's the backdrop for the entire New Testament, right? One of the most brutal, dehumanizing regimes in all of human history. And yet the followers of Jesus are never told to storm Rome, are never told to mount an armed revolution, to change things. In fact, Jesus says what? Pay your taxes. Be a good citizen. What they were taught, however, was to love God and love their neighbor. Those like them, those unlike them, even their enemies in the midst of the Roman Empire. And guess what happened? The Roman Empire faded into dust. History. The church, however, is alive and growing all over the world. 2,000 years later. Third, Jesus is saying that loving God and loving neighbor cannot be separated. Now, I think we have a tendency still to pull these two apart that Jesus says belong together. For example, some who call themselves Christians really like the loving God part. You know, go to church, study his word, but allow themselves to pick and choose who their neighbors are. Others of us really like the loving neighbors part. But we like to pick and choose what we believe about God. To pick and choose your neighbor is, in biblical terms, injustice. You can think about that for a while if you want. To pick and choose your God, in biblical terms, is idolatry. You can think about that as well. It's why these two go together, and it's why in the history of God's people, these are two of the greatest sins that God attacks and confronts, idolatry and injustice, because they belong together. And our vision here at Chapel Street is to be a family of neighborhood churches striving to put loving God and loving neighbor together as they should be. But there's a third part of this story. I'm calling it a personal invitation. Verse 32. And the scribe said to him, you are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one and there is no other besides him. And to love him with all the heart and with all the understanding and with all the strength and to love one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. <laughs> the scribe says, you're right, teacher. Good answer. It's almost funny when you think about it. He's talking to Jesus. But then he adds something we need to see here. He says, and to love him with all the heart, with all the understanding, with all the strength, and one's neighbor as oneself is much more than all whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. Now remember, where is this conversation taking place? In the temple compound, at the very center of the ancient sacrificial system of Israel. The scribe is picking up the heart of what Jesus is saying here. And he's saying, if you are who you say you are, Jesus, if the kingdom of God is now present in you, that means that this entire system is going to be rendered irrelevant. And, that's, and if that's true, he's thinking, that's really good news. It's good news. But in the back of his mind, I think he's also thinking, but to teach that is really dangerous. Because if you teach that, that could get you killed. And then verse 34. And when Jesus saw that he answered wisely, he said to him, you're not far from the kingdom of God. And after that, no one dared ask him any more questions. That's Mark's way of saying it was a mic drop moment. <laughs> you're not far from the kingdom of God. Now this, I think, had to be surprising to this scribe, right? 
He had to assume that he, if anybody, was already in. I mean, he knew God's law. He explained God's law to other people. Jesus says, you're not far. Had to be shocking. What does Jesus mean? Well, remember, Mark began his gospel story in chapter one like this. Jesus came into Galilee proclaiming the gospel of God and saying, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. Now, what he means, we know, is that the kingdom had come in himself, that he is the gospel of God, the good news. He's saying this uh, to this sincerely seeking scribe. He's saying, you're curious and that's good. You're impressed, maybe. That's good. You ask good questions. You're starting to understand. You're starting to get it. It's not about the temple. It's not about the sacrifices. It's about me. But you're not there yet, he says. I'm right here. You must follow me. Now, what I notice when I read this story is that it doesn't have an ending. This whole interaction ends with a giant question mark, in a way. What did the scribe do? Did he put his faith in Jesus as Messiah and King? Or did he just say, hmm, interesting. I need to think about that and go back to being a scribe. Did he find himself in the crowd a few days later shouting, crucify him, crucify him. We don't know. But today, the story is not about an anonymous scribe 2,000 years ago. Today, the story is about us. It's about you and me. Now, maybe you're here today or maybe you're watching online because you're interested in Jesus. Something about him has impressed you. Maybe you're curious. Maybe you just have questions about him and for him. Maybe you're this close, but you haven't surrendered heart, soul, mind, and strength to Jesus as king. As king. Here's the thing. Jesus is saying that to love God is to surrender to him. To love God is to surrender to Jesus. To love your neighbor requires surrender to Jesus. Now that surrender might be reluctant, like C.S. Lewis. That surrender might be after being filled with all kinds of doubts, like Thomas. That surrender might be desperate, like Lucy and her story, or the dying thief on the cross. But that surrender must come. And he's right here. Would you bow with me as I close? Lord, how we thank you for your word today. We thank you for this ancient but so contemporary conversation. What do you want most from me and for me? How do we love you? How do we love our neighbor, even that one? What does it mean to surrender to you as Lord and King? Lord, I pray for those here today or who are watching online who are close, who are interested who are seeking, who are asking questions. We're so close. So by your spirit, allow them to open their hearts and open their minds to believe, to trust, to surrender, and to follow. These things we pray in your name. Amen. Just before the benediction today, I just want to invite any of you who might have uh, been prompted by the Holy Spirit to surrender your heart to, to Jesus today as King. Just meet me down here in front. I'd love to encourage you, maybe pray for you. Uh, I'd be happy to spend that time with you. Receive now today's benediction from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. May you go now in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ and may the God of peace sanctify you through and through. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus the one who calls is faithful, and he will do it. Amen. Have a great day.